All right. This episode is going to make an impact on you. It is an excellent conversation. My guest is Ari Witten. He is a functional medicine expert and the founder of the energy blueprint. He, this, I, I love how much information Ari has and also how he is able to deliver it in a way that really impacts it really sticks. And so, um, we're talking about his latest book today, eat for energy, how to beat fatigue, supercharge your mitochondria and unlock all day energy. Um, Ari has several books. Um, he has one on red light therapy, also one called forever fat loss and the low carb myth. So we're a little bit aligned on some of our thoughts around that. Um, but yeah, we really dive into mitochondria today and wow, you're just gonna be blown away. I'm not going to take up any more time on this intro. Just wait till you hear the information that comes out on today's episode. Um, please share this with people that you think might to need to know it, especially people who are dealing with low mood, low energy levels, um, possibly chronic fatigue or something close to that depression, you know, anything like that, please share this with the people that you love. It's a really, really great episode. So we'll go ahead and dive in. Here is Ari Witten. Okay. So Ari, I wanted to, you've got several books here we could talk about, and this is going to be really, really fun, but I wanted to start um, with your new book, Eat for Energy and Mitochondrial Health. And I heard you, I told you, I heard you on Dave Asprey's podcast and you were sharing about exercise in terms of energy and mitochondrial health. And I was wondering if we could kick that off because that was music to my ears. Can you share about that? Okay. So, um, which, well, did you have a specific aspect of it that you want to go into? Let's start, let's back up a little bit. Like I heard you say, you know, of all all the things you've looked at in terms of energy, that the most upstream thing you can find is mitochondria. So can you talk about that? Because like, of course there's vitamin deficiencies and neurotransmitter issues and inflammation and under recovery and lack of sleep and stuff. But you know, can you talk about why people need to be thinking about their mitochondria in terms of their energy levels? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've been studying health science since I was a, a little kid, since I was like 12 or 13 years old. And uh, for m- the first decade or so, it was very focused on the world of body composition, fat loss, yeah. muscle gain, bodybuilding, right. um, athletic performance. I was an athlete. I was an aspiring bodybuilder. Uh, and that was my world for a long time. And, uh, and then in my mid twenties, I got very sick with mononucleosis and, mm. um, you know, to condense many years of my life into a, a couple sentences, I, I spent a <laughs> lot of time, uh, pursuing conventional medical avenues to deal with chronic fatigue that I was left with from that, as well as, mm-hmm. um, alternative medicine and functional medicine stuff. And mm-hmm. ultimately kind of discovered no one knows what the hell they're talking about when it comes to energy. And what mm-hmm. is actually controlling and regulating human energy? Um, mm-hmm. in, and and uh, in that realization, that was sort of the catalyst for me to shift my focus there. That's something I've been doing for the last decade. And um, in the in, in the initial years, I was basically just sort of exploring one layer of that story and trying to piece things together. You know, um, mm-hmm. I knew that sleep and circadian rhythm tied into mm-hmm. this energy story, so I spent you know, tons of time, months and months and months digging into the scientific literature around that. What are the mechanisms of how sleep and circadian rhythm impact upon energy? How is this being mediated Mm -hmm. by neurotransmitters and hormones and at the mitochondrial level, what's going on? And how do I make sense of that? Um, And different biochemical mechanisms. And then um, what about nutrition? Of course, nutrition ties into this story as well. What are, what are the mechanisms of how nutrition relates to cellular energy production and our right. physical energy levels. Um, and, you know, what about environmental toxicants and what about gut health and what about yeah. body composition and, yeah. you know, layer by layer by layer, yeah. I was going through the literature and this was years and years of my life, piecing together some kind of narrative of mm. mechanisms of physiological mechanisms that we can understand why our bodies are either chronically fatigued or have youthful levels of energy. And at the end of all those years, I was left with this sort of 150 uh, mechanism long list of all these different mechanisms right. and hormones and neurotransmitters <laughs> and biochemical pathways that in one way or another uh, relate to this story of, of energy production. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't until uh, 2014 with um, the work of a researcher named Dr. Robert Navio, who runs a lab for mitochondrial medicine, at the University of California, San Diego, 
uh, and he published a paper called the cell danger response. This is, I think, one of the most important papers in, in mm. medicine in the last century. And um, this was the thing that helped me create uh, a, a, a coherent, synthesized narrow, uh, um, framework for all of this 150 mechanism long list mm. that I created of all these different pathways. Nice. Um, some kind of understanding of what is the most upstream thing. And what I mean by that is there, you know, if you think of a car um, and, and a car traveling down the road, you could, someone could say, oh, well, you know, the car is only traveling down the road because of the spark plugs. The spark plugs are what's <laughs> doing it, right? Or no, and someone else could say, no, it's the pistons. The pistons right. in the engine are doing, no, no, it's the exhaust system and the catalytic converter. No, it's the fuel. No, it's the right. it's the 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 accelerator pedal, right? right? Right. And so there's all these different um pieces inside of that mm -hmm. car that mm -hmm. are necessary for that car to drive. Right. But do not regulate whether mm -hmm. the car is turned on or is at a stop or is driving down the road right. at 80 miles per hour, right? So right. we have to and and there's a lot of confusion out there, I think in the, in both conventional medical world and, and natural health yeah. functional medicine world, as far as differentiating mechanisms that are necessary for certain functions versus mechanisms that regulate certain mm. functions. So whether that car is driving down the road or not depends upon the person sitting in the car, pressing either the accelerator pedal or the brake, you know, um, not whether you know, that, that it's not the spark plug that's regulating things or the piston or the catalytic converter, right? So we have to understand that distinction. And when it comes yeah. to physiology, the main thing that is regulating our energy is actually our mitochondria. It is the most upstream thing. And um, in this paper from Dr. Robert Navio, the big shift in our understanding around mitochondria is that they are not just these sort of mindless cellular energy generators that the, the way they're portrayed in, um, as, as we learn about them as the powerhouse of the cell in, in high school and college mm -hmm. um, and graduate school biology courses and physiology courses, they are, um, they are actually exquisitely sensitive environmental sensors. They're basically like the canaries in the coal mine of our body. And mm. they are constantly taking samples of the environment of what's going inside going on inside of our bodies and they're asking the question are we safe are we under attack um is it safe to produce energy they're constantly asking that question and they mm. it turns out they can detect virtually any and every type of stressor and threat imaginable from uh, poor nutrition to sleep deprivation to psychological stress, to environmental toxicants, to poor gut health, to uh, uh, respiratory infections uh, and, and viruses, to really any other type of stressor you can think up. Mitochondria can detect it. We can talk in, in detail about how they do that if you want. But yes, they please. can. De <laughs> they, the, so the, the, the main ways they do that is um, it's not that they have receptors for psychological stress and they have receptors yeah. for environmental toxicants <laughs> and mercury receptors and alcohol <laughs> receptors and, um, um, uh, you know, wh whatever else. Uh, it's that virtually every type of stressor ultimately converges on certain pathways. They increase oxidative stress, they increase mm -hmm. inflammation, or they increase mm -hmm. cellular damage. And mitochondria mm -hmm. can detect all of those three things. So- um, in response to detecting those threat signals, whether they're from physical overtraining or a physical injury or a respiratory infection or environmental toxicants or heavy metals or psychological stress or sleep deprivation um, or crappy diet, they're sensing those signals. And yeah. in response to that, this is the important part, in, to the degree they are sensing threats that the body is under attack in some way. They are turning down the dial on energy production and shifting resources towards cellular defense. So mm -hmm. we have these two roles of mito mitochondria have two roles, either mm -hmm. in energy mode or cellular defense. And to wow. the extent that they are doing cellular defense, they're turning down the dial on energy production. Wow. So that's 
the, the first and most important aspect yes. to understand when it comes to, to what is actually controlling and regulating human energy levels. What is the most upstream thing that is deciding whether you have youthful, abundant levels of energy or you're chronically fatigued? Wow. That is so beautifully put. Thank you for sharing that. And I, it's just funny that you know, I, di I didn't even think about this. I made a post this morning on Instagram about CNS fatigue and fatigue because normally I have, I'm, I'm pretty naughty about my sleep schedule. Okay. It's like, Nope. Bye everybody. Peace out. I got to go to bed because I want to get up at the same time. And I want my circadian rhythm set. Cause I feel freaking amazing. You know, I've got my morning routine and my workout and I just love the way I feel all the time, but I just got back from vacation with my kids. And then I had a couple late nights when I got back and got slammed with all this work stuff. I've got an app with all these workouts. I had to go film all of them yesterday. You know, it was like a ton of, got to be on camera on point, working out hard, you sleep schedule's messed up. And I woke up this morning and I went to the gym. And as soon as I did my first set, it was like, nope, 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 nope. And I was like, <laughs> okay, let's talk about CNS fatigue. And so I experienced that now for me, somebody who's pretty tuned into my body instantly, I'm like, rest mode, rest mode, say no to stuff. I'm not going to go do that event that I was going to do. I'm going to chill. I'm going to relax. I'm going to eat good food. I'm going to sleep. I might go for a walk. I'm going to do things that bring me joy. You, have, you know, all that kind of stuff, but it's most people, what I'm finding, and I'm sure you too, it's, it's society, society wide. It's socially insulted to let yourself recover and get out of this defense mode, right? Like clearly my cells are like, Hey, 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 chill. <laughs> we're tired and we're trying to recover from all that crap yesterday, you know? Um, and most people it's, there's a rejection of that. I find it's, Oh, like what's wrong with me? Oh, come on. Like, okay. More caffeine, more uppers, more, you know, Adderall even, or whatever, like we're drugging ourselves to stay in this place all the time, instead of being able to l allow that recovery or that letting down of the shields you're talking about on the defense mode. And so I'm curious what your biggest hitters are for getting out of cellular. I mean, obviously there's, you got it. You truly have like a probably 150 thing less, right. But the biggest hitters of, um, okay, I'm in that mode. I'm in that mode. I, I feel this fatigue all the time. I'm like, ugh. like I always say to my clients, it feels like you're like eyes are crossed. You're just like, ugh, I can't, you know, that to me, that's like massive under recovery, low HRV, <laughs> poor um, nervous system health and, you know, all those things. But what are your biggest hitters for somebody who's in that mode a lot? Like they're just feeling super fatigued all the time. What are the biggest hitters you'd have them look at? I think that there's, there's a, a couple aspects of this, and I'll, I want to zoom out for just a second in my response to your to your question. So, okay. um, I want to talk about oscillation. What I mean mm -hmm. by that is um, there there are two really important aspects of creating good health that most people suck at, and <laughs> one is to create spikes of hormetic stress. And we can yeah. talk about the mechanisms yes. and how that ties into this whole mitochondrial story yeah. um, that I that I just sort of explained. Mm -hmm. um, there's another really key component of that that I haven't gone into yet. And um, you got to create spikes of hormetic stress in your life. Most people, that typical person, maybe not the listener of this podcast, maybe your podcast is especially good at that. And they're very into <laughs> fitness and they bio. are, you guys are, I know it. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so there's that. So the typical person in our society does not have adequate levels of hormetic stress and adequate yeah. spikes into those hormetic stressors, yes. uh, especially at the right dosage. Okay. So there's a lot mm -hmm. going on there. That's really mm -hmm. important and central to mitochondrial health, disease prevention, longevity, energy, all of those stories. Um, at the same time, we need to oscillate from those spikes of hormetic yeah. stress into dips of yeah. intense recovery. Intense yes. might not be the right word, but but like very focused, um, like intensive recovery strategies. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and and um, these can be things like massage. It can be naps, sunbathing, red and near infrared light therapy, um, thermal approaches sauna right. and right. and and cold tubs there you know there's nuances there um nutrition relates to this story sleep yes. and circadian rhythm relates to this story um 
you know, meditation, yoga, stretching, uh, something called one of my favorites is uh, non sleep deep rest practices or yoga nidra practices. Yoga nidra is like, um, a, yeah. it's, it doesn't involve yoga postures, but it's more like laying still on the floor yeah. and doing a guided body scan process. It puts yeah. you into a very unique state of consciousness that's, um, you're still awake, but it's almost deeper than sleep. And uh, it's it's hard to describe. You don't really enter that state of consciousness in any other way. Maybe acupuncture is the only time I can think that enter I enter a similar state of consciousness. Um, but and acupuncture is maybe another good thing to list here. But all of those practices, massage, foam rolling, music can be integrated into this um, and and layered with some of these other practices that I just mentioned. But integrating those things systematically into your life is critically mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and most people aren't doing either of these things very well. Yeah. So they're in this sort of flat lining state. They don't have the spikes right. in hormetic stress. They don't have the dips of intensive recovery. They're in this sort of chronic low level stress all the time. Yeah. Go, go, go mode. Yep. And I would also say, you know, that's sort of one unique category of people is the sort of the average general public. But mm -hmm. on this podcast, maybe you've got a lot of fit biohackers and the tendency there is maybe to do too much of the spikes into yep. hormetic stress without yep. the, the, the opposite of the, the intensive recovery Yes. Uh, phases linked into their life. Yeah. I, I love, I would love to go deeper into this. I had a, um, a, a moment. I had a moment. <laughs> it was, I was talking to a friend who is in the health field. He is a doctor, but his business is growing like crazy. And I know he doesn't train. I know he doesn't work out. Right. And he asked me, he was like, how do you have so much energy all day? Like it's insane. And I was like, I thought about it for a second. And I was like, Honestly, I think it's because I train so hard and I have adapted my body to that, that like everything else in life, like my daily life feels really easy compared to how intense I can go in training. And I've done that over many years so that I can fully recover from those workouts. Like I can go beast mode almost seven days a week. Not everyone can do that. And I know why I can, I get super good sleep. Like I am gone. Like <laughs> I always tell people, I'm like, you don't have to ask me how I slept. It's going to be the same answer every Every time like the dead. Okay. Thank you for asking though. Like, I don't remember anything, you know, and I, and you know, just from tracking sleep. I mean, my deep sleep is insane. It's, I get very, when I used to wear a whoop strap and a war ring, I'd be like 98% recovered, 99% recovered, like wow. almost every day, even training wow. really hard, but I'm very intentional about listening to my body when it's under recovered like today. And it was like, Nope, I literally just stopped right in the middle of my set, walked on the treadmill a little bit, sent some emails and walked, went home. Right. And I will sleep tonight and I will not train again until my body is like, let's go baby. You know? And yeah. I do think you're exactly right. Like there's no, um, resiliency being developed from the hormetic stress, which by the way, I don't know if you've been on Dr. Pompa's podcast, but he would love you. He's all about hormetic stress from training. And we, we went deep on his podcast about that, yeah, but I have, I have, yeah, you have. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of hormetic stress on the mitochondria, you were mentioning this in terms of like how much mitochondrial efficacy we lose throughout the aging process. Can you share about that and how exercise impacts that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as I explained before, the, the, the first and central thing to understand about energy regulation is total body stress load determines to what degree your mitochondria are either in energy mode or defense mode. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there's another second piece that ties into this story. That's critically important. And it has to do with what is the status of your mitochondria inside of your cells. And specifically what I mean by that is are your cells filled with big, strong, healthy mitochondria and lots of them? Or are they filled with weak, atrophied, fragile, dysfunctional mitochondria and very few of them? Mm -hmm. Okay, so on average, we have between about 500 to 2000 mitochondria per cell um, in virtually all of the cells of our body and, and virtually all of the energy for virtually all of those cells in our body, from our brain to our liver, to our intestines, to our muscles, to our hormone producing gland cells, rely almost exclusively on energy from mitochondria. Now, if you understand that, consider this. Um, research has shown in, in numerous studies that on average, people's mitochondrial capacity, how much energy they can produce at the cellular level declines 
by about 10% with each decade of life. Maybe doesn't sound like that much, but here's another way of, of saying that. Research has shown that the typical 70 year old has lost 75% of their mitochondrial capacity of their cellular engine. This is like going from a Ferrari engine in your cells when you're 20 to a moped engine when yeah. you're 70. Right. Okay. And there's, there's many aspects of that that are critical to understand. One is this energy story. Okay. Which is of course, if you have if you're functioning at only 25% of your energy producing capacity at the cellular level, you're going to have a lot less energy, period. That's a huge factor to consider that. And this is something that's widely not known and not talked about within the natural health and, and functional medicine community, where even people who talk about mitochondria lump things under this label of mitochondrial dysfunction. And then you know, it's like, oh, you have mitochondrial dysfunction. So let's put you on this supplement regimen of taking B vitamins and CoQ10 and acetylcarnitine and alpha lipoic acid and yada, yada, yada. Okay. Right. But guess what? Taking all those supplements doesn't fix the <laughs> fact that your mitochondrial engine is at 25% capacity. Okay. It can, it mm -hmm. can help the function of the existing mitochondria, but it doesn't rebuild the engine. Mm. Right. So it's like, you know, helping in the car analogy, it's like replacing the oil and putting right. good fuel into that system and, um, you know, changing the spark plugs and the pistons right. and stuff like that. But it, it is it is not going from a two cylinder engine to an eight cylinder engine. Mm. Okay? And that's that's the main focus of what we need mm. to be doing that. And that's something widely neglected. Now, um, the, the good so people might be thinking, wow, that really sucks that aging destroys our mitochondria, our cellular engine so badly. But the good news here is that actually this is not a natural product of aging itself. This is actually the result of modern lifestyle, specifically mm. lack of hormetic stress is what drives wow. this process. So in the, in the wow. same way that if you break a bone, you get a cast on, and then you know eight weeks later, you get that cast sawn off, and then you look down at your arm and you see that it's half the size as the other one, it's because <laughs> yeah. all those muscles atrophied hugely, huge amount of atrophy in just the span of two months, okay? Mm -hmm. that, that, that process basically is, is going on because the body is ruthless about getting rid of energetically costly tissue that isn't needed for survival. Body cares about survival. Right. Right, so right. it adapts to the conditions imposed upon it in, in an effort to better survive those conditions. So if you put a cast on your arm or your leg and immobilize it so that you're not using those muscles, guess what? In the matter of a few weeks, the body goes, oh, I guess that muscle isn't needed for survival. Let's get rid of it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. In two months. Right. So right. imagine now what happens if you are, if you've cut out the things that instead of challenging your muscles, the things that challenge your mitochondria yeah. internally, if you've cut those out of your life, not just for two months, but right. and not just for two years, but for two or three or four or five or six right. decades of your right. life, if you're deficient in hormetic stress, which are the things that challenge and stimulate mitochondria, guess what the body does? Same thing as muscle. It goes, Right. I guess we don't need all those energetically right. costly mitochondria to survive. Right. Let's get rid of them. Wow. So that's why people lose 75% of their mitochondrial capacity with aging. And the good news is that um, it's been shown that 70 year olds who are lifelong exercisers do not lose 75% of their mitochondrial capacity. They have the same mitochondrial capacity as a young adult. So powerful. In having these layers of hormetic stress built into our life is critically important to maintain our mitochondria and build them. And we can mm -hmm. regrow them as well. We can stimulate mitochondrial growth and biogenesis through hormetic stress. Yeah. And, um, and the last thing I'll mention here is, I, I think I meant to say this earlier, this is not just an energy story, but this, our mitochondrial capacity also relates massively to uh, disease prevention and the rate of aging itself, how our, our lifespan and relates to our resilience to stress as well. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of, 
ice baths and even doing something like keto was a hormetic stress, right? Which they find increases mitochondrial biogenesis, right? So any sort of stressor like that is, yeah, I, it makes me think of my grandma. She was, when I went to her 90th birthday party, I had not seen her in like, I don't know, six or seven years. Okay. And I had two little kids at the time that she, I don't, I'm pretty sure she didn't even meet my kids. Okay. So I came down, she's like, how's Mackenzie? How's Jerem? I'm like, you know, my kids names. <laughs> like, I was like, wow. She was just so sharp. And she hiked mountains all over the world with her husband, all clear into old age. She was really into genealogy work, constantly stimulating her mind, um, constantly reaching out new social connections, putting herself in, you know, uncomfortable situations. And she was just completely, I was like, wow, you're like more cognitively functioning than I am, you know? So yeah, that's very, very inspiring. Are there any other hormetic stressors that you like besides just exercise? Like, uh, well, yeah, you kind of listed some of them before, but are there any big faves for mitochondrial biogenesis? Absolutely. I'm a huge fan of saunas and the yeah. research on, on saunas is extremely robust as far mm. as, um, I mean, there's, there's so many improvements we could talk about in terms of different metabolic parameters, in terms of nice. improving recovery, in terms of in, enhancing and amplifying adaptations to exercise, particularly endurance exercise. Um, and uh, as far as disease prevention, it's, the research is amazing. It's, it's to give you a sense of the magnitude, um, regular sauna use is associated with up to 60, 65% reductions in risk of cardiovascular disease, wow. in risk of neurological disease, wow. and in terms of cardio, in, in terms of all cause mortality. That's the risk of dying from any cause. Now, wow. just to, to sort of ground this in a context, if there was a, a drug from a pharmaceutical company that showed those same effects, everything I just listed, you know, improvements in athletic performance <laughs> and recovery. Yeah. And, um, reducing your risk of all these different diseases and dying from any causes, the whole world and all your doctors and all the miracle, government agencies right, would, right. would be enlisted in getting everybody on this thing immediately. Yeah. And, and your yeah. doctor, it would be hailed as the greatest miracle drug in history. Yep. And, yep. uh, and, and every, and, you know, every doctor would look at you like you're absolutely nuts if you weren't doing this all drug. Right. Okay. Well, the drug exists. It's just in the form of a sauna, not a pill from a pharmaceutical company. And wow. um, so that's that's a, a an amazing one. And is I that real say, quick? Is that infrared saunas or just any just the hormetic stress of the heat of a sauna? Do you, is it specified? Yeah, we can we can go into detail sure. on on that if you want. Maybe maybe we'll loop back to that and I'll okay. finish this this first one. Yeah. So because I have a lot to say on that topic. Um, okay. So. <laughs> Um, breath holding practices is another one I'm, I'm a huge fan of. I built mm. a program with, uh, in mm. tandem with Patrick McCown, who's a, a world renowned breathing expert. I built a program nice. with him called, uh, breathing for energy, um, that has, um, uh, a whole set of guided nice. systematic levels of breath holding practice that take people all the way from like 10, 15 second breath holds, which is typical, maybe of somebody with severe chronic fatigue all the way up to three minutes and beyond. Um, wow. So, wow. <laughs> and a whole That's bunch of you next know, level. <laughs> I do some yeah, of that totally. work myself. And I, so I respect that. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Not there yet. <laughs> so, yeah. So, the, and, and every type of hormetic stress has its own sort of unique fingerprint of the specific kinds of adaptations it's stimulating, right? Even with exercise, different categories of exercise stimulate right. things in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. Resistance training creates a different fingerprint of adaptations right. compared to endurance or high intensity interval training, stimulating different energy systems. You know, one okay. might cause muscle growth, another doesn't. Um, right. So, even within this one category of exercise, there's big differences in terms yeah. of the adaptations. Sauna has its own unique fingerprint, cold therapy has its own unique fingerprint. Breath holding has its own unique fingerprint. For example, altering the, the structural interface between the lungs and the blood. It's physically altering that interface to enhance wow. gas exchange. It's physically altering the interface between the capillaries and the cells. It's physically altering wow. the mitochondria to be able to extract oxygen and utilize oxygen more efficiently to tolerate low oxygen states more efficiently. So yeah. they, they all have this um, really unique fingerprint and that's why there's, there's yeah. benefits to doing these, these different types. So anyway, yeah. that's, that's a, 
this is my favorite topic. I could talk for hours on it, but I um, love it. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Info. Uh, but if you want, we can get, I can talk about the, the sauna question. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Okay. So, um, Without being too harsh here, there are lots of things that have been said by the infrared sauna industry mm. that um, are just lies. Wow. Um, they, they, they've, they've distorted the science a lot in an effort to market and sell infrared saunas as being this amazingly superior technology wow. to uh, traditional saunas. And the research doesn't support Wow. most of these claims. So um, I'll, I'll name a few of these claims. One is the idea that uh, these infrared rays are penetrating deeply into your body and sort of heating you up from the inside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, first of all, that's, that's really not true. I mean, it's like technically mm -hmm. true in the, in a very superficial sense that infrared rays do sort of penetrate a little bit into the body, but they penetrate mostly just the skin and the initial layers right beneath the skin um, they, the infrared rays get absorbed by the water right beneath the skin. Mm. They do not penetrate inches deep in your body or pass through your body or something like that. Um, I've written a book called the ultimate guide to red and near infrared light therapy. In contrast, mm. red light and near infrared light do have the potential to penetrate up to a few inches deep in our body, but infrared saunas use mostly far infrared energy, some extent, mid infrared energy. And um, those really get absorbed by water at, at the very superficial layers just around the skin and below the skin. So number one is this idea they're penetrating inside your body, heating you up from the inside is wrong. And also as an extension of this, um, they have claimed a couple things. One, they've claimed that uh, by heating you up from the inside and heating up your cells, that the sweat that is produced is 10 times or 20 times richer in toxins. This is also mm -hmm. false. Mm -hmm. Sweat is sweat for the most part. There, it's not infrared sweat isn't dis different from exercise sweat versus traditional sauna sweat. They're all sort of equally rich in toxins to the best of the studies that have tested that. That's what we know. So that's another sort of aspect that, 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 that industry has lied about and distorted the evidence around, um, and just created myths to, to yeah. sell saunas that, that aren't yeah. supported by the evidence. Uh, the other thing, the most important thing to understand is they've created, you know, there's a, there's a big difference between the temperature that infrared saunas are versus the temperature that traditional saunas are. Um, infrared saunas typically are around 150, 140 degrees. Fahrenheit, whereas traditional saunas are typically two, uh, uh, 180 to 220 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a big difference. Yeah. Uh, if you've ever been in a 200 degree sauna versus 150 degree sauna, there's an enormous difference between those two. Yeah, things. I've experienced that. I'm like, and then not as hot one. I'm like, is this really good or? <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, um, and, and part of the misunderstanding is that they've created a narrative that the benefits of sauna result purely from sweating and detoxification, eliminating toxins. And that is also a false narrative because uh, it is very likely, I would say on the order of like 99.999% likely, that's how confident I am in this assertion, uh, that a lot of the benefits of sauna do not come just from detoxification and sweating, but come from heat stress on the yeah. body. Yeah. Okay. So going into a sauna, which does or doesn't create a significant amount of heat stress potentially makes a big difference, right? Yeah. I can go yeah. in a 150 degree sauna and stay in there com comfortably for an hour without <laughs> right. ever getting to the point of, oh my gosh, I'm over. I got to get so out of here. Yeah. I got to escape this room. <laughs> right. Whereas in a traditional sauna, yep. I might at, at 210 degrees, maybe I can tolerate 10 or 15 minutes. And before I go, oh my God, it's so hot. I got to get out of here. Yep. Right. So yep. those two things are physiologically different guaranteed. Yeah. If you are subjectively feeling those, those two states that differently, guaranteed, there's a big physiological difference. And yeah. I think it's, although we still need more research around this, I think I can, 
I can pretty much guarantee listeners that there's a big physiological difference between those two. Well, it makes sense. Like if you look at, at, you know, cold immersion as on the opposite end of the spectrum, it's like, okay, well, it increases adiponectin or it increases brown fat, but like the major benefit, like, why does that happen? Because of the stress that happens like this house that I'm in now, it just does the water just doesn't get that cold. So I just haven't even been bothering. Cause I'm like, it's not taking a cool, refreshing rain shower is not doing anything. It's got to be like, well, like I got to go into like massive stoic. I got this, that kind of feeling, you know, or you're just totally. not getting, it's, it's just like, I, you know, tease about like lifting weights. If I'm just like talking to my girlfriend about coffee yesterday while I do bicep curls, I always, I'm so, I'm so blunt. I'm like, you're not doing shit. You're not doing shit. <laughs> like you've got, it's got to suck. It's got to be uncomfortable to create a stimulus for change in your body. Right. Exactly. So, so going back to, you know, kind of what I was the, the frame that I was talking about earlier with like muscle atrophy, mitochondrial atrophy in order to get the opposite effect to get, let's say muscle growth or mitochondrial growth, you have to create the stimulus for adaptation. Yeah. You have, your yes. body has to be getting a signal I have to adapt to this environment right. by changing. Yep. Okay? And so if you're doing something like exercise or sauna or cold or whatever type of hormetic stress and it's comfortable, the body doesn't have to change. It doesn't have to grow new muscle or grow more mitochondria or do anything right. to adapt to that because it's already handling it with ease. It's already within its capacity. Exactly. So in order to get change at the physiological level, you have to push that envelope of its current capacity. Exactly. It's like when I get a new client and they're like, Hey, can I still run three miles in the morning? I'm like, Oh, how long have you been doing that? Oh, for years. I'm like, sure. I mean, you're not going to get any changes in your body because of it. Your body's completely adapted and used to that now, but if you like doing it, go from, go for it. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, it's not going to mess up your training that much because it's not a new stressor. Like it's your body. That's just normal for you now. So right. yeah. And that's what I love about adaptation is like, you slowly increase your new normal, you know, it's just like, okay, now, like if, if a newbie client tried to train at the intensity levels that I'm training at, they would be crushed. They would have a hard time recovering from that. They would need a lot more recovery time and probably your yoga Nidra and some acupuncture, and, you know, some cold ice baths and some deep sleep and all those things. So, yes. yes. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll just add quickly one mm -hmm. little layer to this that might be worth mm -hmm. just stating out loud. The cool thing about hormetic stress is that it, it it doesn't by exposing yourself to a particular type of hormetic stressor, whether it's heat or cold or um, weight training or something like that, it doesn't only make you more resistant to the stress of that particular stressor. It actually creates adaptations at the mitochondrial level that make you more resistant to a broad range of other stressors. Yeah. So yeah. Um, there is there is a general translation into increased resilience and and without getting too detailed, part of the mechanism is mitochondrial growth. Having a bigger cellular engine means that that workload of whatever stressor you're exposed to is shared across more mitochondria and bigger, healthier, mm. healthier mitochondria. Mm. It's like if if you and I've got to put out a fire, is it easier for us to? Um, do that me by myself or, right. and you, or you by yourself, or if we're both working together and we're sharing right. the load, right. Or 600 of our friends. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. So if we, if we get to share that load, then each of us has to do less work and, yeah. and our work capacity isn't exceeded. If I have to do it by myself, maybe I'm dumping buckets furiously. I'm working my, my ass off. Right. I'm spraying it with a hose and da, da, da. I'm, I'm going for hours and hours and hours. And maybe I get totally exhausted. Maybe I get so exhausted I can't even put out the fire, right? I don't, I'm not even successful. Right. Whereas right. if I've got your help and maybe the help of many others, each of us has to do much less and we're yeah. actually successful in putting out the fire. And the yeah. same exact thing is true with regards to mitochondria being handling stress. Now, so mitochondria growing bigger and stronger. And the other thing is something called the ARE, the antioxidant response element. And this is our internal antioxidant and detoxification system consists of things like glutathione and catalase and superoxide dismutase. And it has to do with the internal cellular capacity to neutralize oxidative stress, which occurs from, you know, basically a broad range of any type of stressor and detoxification system. So it also helps increase your capacity to detoxify, for example, environmental toxicants. So that's, mm. that's why, for example, 
doing exercise, you know, working your muscles yeah. can translate into decreased neurodegenerative disease or something like that, or why yeah. sauna therapy can translate into decreased neurodegenerative disease and dying, risk of dying from any cause, right? It doesn't just make you more resistant to heat stress. It doesn't just make your muscles right. stronger. It's translating into this broad increase in resistance to a, a large range of other stressors. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I went through a very, very stressful time in my life. And I was always like, I can't believe I didn't get like adrenal fatigue or hypothyroidism or <laughs> Lyme disease or something. I mean, it was like really high, but my mom was a, a runner way back in the day. And one thing she taught me when I was growing up with running, she's like, when stress goes up, the basics become more important. Don't forget the basics, especially when there's a lot of stress. So when I went through that time, I was like, I have to keep exercising. I have to keep eating healthy. I have to keep hydrating. I have to keep, you know, meditating, going into some calm and some breath work and things like that. And so I think, you know, probably the machinery that I had built in my body already before that huge life stressor on top of keeping those basics in place. I mean, you know, I think anybody, we can all become that resilient to a huge, you know, I, it was, I had lost everything, right. I didn't have a place to live. It was a very scary time in my life. And it, it was, I started doing cold showers during that time in my life as well. And I, I became such a fan because I literally experienced, I was like, wow, my stress tolerance is so high. Mm -hmm. I just feel like I can just breathe. I am probably with breath work, meditation, just all these practices. I was like, I can just tolerate so much stress. This is absolutely incredible. You know? So yeah, I can vouch for all, everything that you're saying works. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate your analogies too. Cause I love analogies. And that's like the fire, you know, when you have thousands upon thousands of mitochondria be like, Oh, we got it. We can help. You know, it's mm -hmm. really different than having 150 little weak ones that are like, Nope, can't handle anything. You know, exactly. So, exactly. Amazing. My, uh, <clears throat> my, we have a, a nanny, she's like 26 years old. And she, uh, um, she said to me yesterday or the day before she goes, you know, how do you have energy from like, she asked me what time I wake up. I said, 6am. And she goes, how do you have energy from like 6 a.m. to 9 p.m.? Like so much yeah. energy, like you constantly are going like podcasts and playing with the kids and running around skateboarding in the park and going for yep. bike rides and surfing yep. and rock climbing. And like, she's like, and she's a fit, you know, girl who's more than 10 years younger than me. And she's yeah. like, how do you have that much energy? I'm like, I guess what I teach works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You've built it over time. And yeah. we have like a few more minutes. I want to try to get in what we can, because obviously your book is about eating for energy and you have another book, The Low Carb Myth. And we talked about this a little. Can you just talk about your basic um, philosophy, I guess, your the way you see nutrition in terms of mitochondrial energy? Okay. It's actually a big question. I don't know if I can answer it succinctly, but um, <laughs> so th there are, you know, with regards to these two roles of mitochondria, either an energy mode or defense mode, there's lots of things going on at the nutritional level that tie into that story, that tie into whether your mitochondria are in energy mode or defense mode. So um, I'll, I'll briefly sort of list off an overview of how that works. Um, one is, of course, having nutritional sufficiency in many of these different vitamins and minerals, yeah. macronutrients that are needed by mitochondria to produce energy. And that's one way mitochondria can sort of start puttering out energy if they're deficient in something. So right. nutritional sufficiency versus deficiency, there's many things that have to be provided in adequate amounts. And nutritional deficiencies are rampant in, yeah. in, uh, in vitamins and, and minerals. Um, yeah there's many statistics on this. There's different ways of breaking it down, but a, a sort of big picture summary might be, it is more than likely that almost everybody, unless you have an amazing diet and you've paid um, extreme amounts of attention to it, and you're probably also supplementing with like a yep. multivitamin mineral supplement yep. um, and, and other supplements, you are probably deficient in at least one or two yeah, vitamins and minerals, and more likely five to six yeah. or five to ten is pretty common. Yeah, so that's one layer to the story. Mm -hmm. Um, and and there's studies, by the way, in chronically fatigued people, just just giving people a high quality multivitamin and mineral supplement um, often increases energy yeah. levels in the span of you know two months by 30, 40 percent. Um, mm -hmm. so it's pretty simple intervention. So that's one layer. Um, 
Another layer is how nutrition ties into circadian rhythm. We have peripheral mm -hmm. clocks in basically all the mm -hmm. tissues of our body. We have a central clock in the brain and we have peripheral clocks in all the other tissues. Central clocks primarily responsive to light. Peripheral clocks primarily are responsive to food inputs. And um, if we are not giving the proper food inputs with regards to circadian rhythm, that's another way the mitochondria can be impaired. Um, gut health is another mechanism through which it can be impaired. Uh, the integrity of our gut barrier and our microbiome yeah. are critically important. There's something called a gut mitochondria axis. And we know that um, mitochondria are, uh, um, sorry, micro our microbiota are involved in metabolizing certain nutrients, producing certain vitamins, um, metabolizing certain phytochemicals, um, mm -hmm. producing short chain fatty acids, which are mm -hmm. critically important anti-inflammatory and pro-energy producing molecules at the mitochondrial level, um, things like butyrate and propionate, uh, propionate. And then um, there's also other ways that the gut impacts on this. For example, um, urolithin. So certain phytochemicals are metabolized by certain um, gut bugs into other chemicals, which impact upon mitochondria. So an example is... Um, uh, elagic acid, which is found in small amounts in many different berries and larger amounts in things like pomegranate and chestnuts, um, is metabolized into a compound called urolithin A, which is the most powerful promoter of mitophagy we've really ever discovered. Uh, and mitophagy Will you explain what is, mitophagy? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> mitophagy is like if you've heard of autophagy, it's the yeah. same thing at the cell at the mitochondrial level. It's basically the uh, a quality control process of the mitochondria where they get rid of dysfunctional, worn out, broken down mitochondria and clean up the genetic pool of mitochondria and should be happening in adequate amounts on a daily, on a nightly basis. Mm -hmm. So it ties into gut health. Your gut has to be healthy and you have to be providing the right things in your diet for that mitochondrial quality control process to be happening. Um, we know that body composition ties into this. If you have excess body fat, that's a source of chronic low-grade inflammation. Those inflammatory molecules, like I said in the beginning of this, are directly sensed by mitochondria as a danger signal and is causing them to turn down the dial on energy wow. production. So, so just chronically all the time, every day. Exactly. Yeah. So, so excess body fat itself is being sensed as a danger signal to, to mitochondria that's turning mm -hmm. down energy production. Um, Another one is uh, how nutrition ties into brain health. And there's many different neurotransmitters um, yeah. that overlap with energy and motivation and drive and mood yeah. and things like that. We need to be providing adequate amounts of those uh, neurotransmitter precursors and substrates. And um, blood sugar is another yeah. one, another yeah. way that this ties in. So um, 30 percent of adults have reactive hypoglycemia. They, they have dips into uh, low blood sugar, two to five hours after meal, that is directly impairing energy production. And more importantly, 80% of adults have um, uh, daily spikes in into pre-diabetic or diabetic ranges yeah. of high blood sugar, which is directly mitochondrial toxic, directly toxic to mitochondria and damages wow. and impairs their ability to produce energy. So um, there's, yeah, there's many different mechanisms of how nutrition yeah. ties into this mitochondrial energy story. Well, thank you so much for summing up like years and years and years and years of research and information into about five minutes or so. And guys, <laughs> if you want to learn more, you can get his book, Eat for Energy. It's a guide to beat fatigue, supercharge your mitochondria and lock all day energy. Um, also, you have your red light therapy book. There's forever fat loss and the low carb myths. So we'll link all of those up in the show notes. And then your website is the energy blueprint. Is that correct? Yeah, the energy, the energy blueprint. Blueprint .com. Dot com and then also on Instagram as the energy blueprint. So we'll link all that up. Ari, thanks for being such a nerd and <laughs> curious. I, I recognize a ceaselessly curious person when I see one. I definitely resonate. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your knowledge with us today. It was absolutely my pleasure, Tara, and uh, and wonderful questions. It was great having this conversation with you. And you know, a lot of interviewers sometimes, you know, I'm sure you've experienced can be annoying. Sometimes they're <laughs> commenting with things that are taking you off track or not asking good <laughs> questions. You added excellent commentary. You asked great questions. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much.